So this is uh, part of a new effort on my part. I'm trying to get back to basics when I do my public speaking, and I think we're missing a lot of, of common sense, basic blocking and tackling, to steal a football metaphor. Um, and information security requires that we do some things all the time, and we do them really well. And one of those things that is actually the foundation of uh, all information security, and I, I don't mean that as just a figure of speech, Every single thing that we do in information security, whether that's attack uh, defense, whether it's perimeter defense, whether that is uh, analysis, whether that's uh, intelligence gathering, threat intelligence, it's all based on the concept that we have reliable, trusted, tested, functional backups to get back to a known state. Without a backup, you don't have anything. Um, and that's, I think, a truism. And maybe we forget sometimes that not everybody coming to us to talk about information security um, or to learn more about information security is going to understand how backups work, what they do, and how critical they are. So we'll start with a few facts and figures, if you wouldn't mind. One is that one-third of IT managers surveyed report that they have personally encountered a data loss when migrating between devices or, or updating operating systems. Now, this doesn't really you know, sound that alarming. I've got a desktop computer. I'm using it for my office support functions. I get a new computer, and I move to it. I migrate to it. Oh, wow, I lost something. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. Um, that, how catastrophic is that? But these are professionals that do this for a living, and they lose things of their own that are important to them. Yikes. What's happening at the corporate level? Well, there's a lot of unreported lost data. Let me tell you, there's a lot of unreported lost data in the corporate setting. Every organization does it, not just corporations. Where a project goes sideways, the conversion fails, and we've lost data along the way. 57% of IT managers claim they have a backup solution in place. However, in practice, 75% of recovery situations find they are not able to restore their data, all of their data completely to the not last known good state. That's a tragic figure, right? Over half of recovery situations end in less than complete success. Maybe not abject failure, but maybe bad enough to be noteworthy. This is a pretty bad, bad statistic. What's even worse is that 23% of people who were surveyed, report, now this, this is surveyed amongst people that do data recovery for a living, that's an IT manager's job, after all. 23% report that even with a backup solution in place, they could not achieve a, 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 even a partial backup. No success. Wow. <laughs> That's catastrophically bad, if you think about it. That number should be 0%, and the one above it should be 0%. But it isn't. Why isn't it? Because most people, most of the time, don't get the concept that they should have a tried and tested backup and recovery process in place. When we look at the fact that the only recovery from a ransomware attack that you can rely on, the only one that works every time is to recover to a known good state, that means that that's the only thing we have. The only defense possible for the classic ransomware attack is recovery to a known good state. Prior to ransomware attacks, four out of five organizations surveyed said they were confident that they could recover to a known good state if they were compromised. And yet, less than half of ransomware victims that actually get attacked can recover to a known good state without loss. What happened to the other half? What happened to their systems? What happened to their data? What happened to their productivity during the recovery period, right? You know it's a tragic state of affairs when a police department in Georgia is attacked with a ransomware uh, a vehicle and the FBI counsels them to pay the ransom, otherwise they've lost all their data, right? That's kind of scary, kind of tragic, kind of fail, right? That has fail written all over it. The stink of fail is all over most organizations' backup and recovery processes. A tested backup is the only defense in some settings, and it is the fail-safe defense for everything else. 
Think of any attack vector you care to name, from something as trivial as a, a virus outbreak, which happens to everybody all the time, out to full on manned penetration using the kill chain to get to your crown jewels, own them and steal them. Every single scenario you can envision requires the use of a recovery from backup. There isn't one if the attacker is successful that doesn't require recovery from a known state. And yet, as we saw in the first slide of stats, most companies can't do recovery to a known state. In ordinary production times, much less under attack from an outside force. So this is a big problem. In every single attack, a tested recovery and back, a backup and recovery strategy that's in practice and verified is essential to smoothly maintain a high state of availability. So let's talk about the various contexts in which we find the need to back up. The first context I'd like to talk about is personal. Each of us in the modern age that functions in the real world that we live in has a need to back up data. Some of us have lots of data. Some have not, not as much. We also have a suite of things that we rely on. Operating systems, and I use the plural. Applications, I doubly would use the plural if I could. Let's talk about operating systems for a minute. What happens if your um, echo becomes corrupt and needs a reboot? Have you thought about that? No, probably, I haven't either, I have one. Every time I've ever had a problem with it, I do a little button pushing and hold some things down and count however many, and then it downloads a fresh copy of the operating system from the cloud, and I'm back in action. What happens if I decide I want to run a variant operating system on that device? How would I back that operating system up? No clue. I'd have to figure that out. Could it be done? Maybe. Maybe not under license that's in place with Amazon, but who knows? But the problem remains. I have a desktop computer. I have a laptop computer. I have a tablet that runs an operating system. I have a server in my house that does file management for me. All of those have operating systems. All of those operating systems have a state that I would like to keep. Because reinstalling from optical media is not always a fun or time-saving opportunity. Especially when you consider if you go back to your, your DVD version of Windows, how many hours of downloads and applications and reboots do you need to get current now? Even Windows 10, I mean, you're talking multiple hours of recovery time to get a running operating system. So you need to have a mechanism whereby you can back up your operating system to its known state so that when the time comes, you can recover your operating system back to its known state. How about the dozens, hundreds, in some cases maybe thousands of apps running on our mobile devices? I just changed phones a while back and I noticed that my Android device uh, app count went from in the 200s down to under 100. It was like in the high 60s. I've really trimmed way down on my apps. Every single one of those apps needs to have its state information backed up. The good news about apps, at least, in some environments is that the state of those apps can be backed up to the cloud, saving you maybe some concern and some recovery time. When I changed phones, I was able to swap phones out, get all of my apps reinstalled, running, configured the way I had them before in a matter of minutes because the state of the app was stored in the cloud storage instead of on the device. So maybe in that sense, OS and apps aren't as big a deal. But all those pictures, all of those voice memos I wanted to keep, all of those downloads I've snagged over the years and stored on my phone, am I backing those up? Can I recover those? It really becomes obvious when you change mobile devices. You've got this legacy of this baggage train of data that follows you when you move from one device to the next device. How about the small office, home office environment? Now all of a sudden we're getting more complicated. Way beyond what just an individual person has, as soon as you have a small business setting where you've got multiple people, all of a sudden everything goes spinning out of control because if everybody's responsible for it, no one is responsible for it, really. 
So in a small business setting, you might wind up with a configuration management issue. I've got eight computers in my small business. Who manages that configuration? Who's responsible for backing up the current operating system state and then testing the ability to recover that operating system state? What's the size of my investment in operating system state? Assuming I'm running legal copies of the operating system, I have an investment in configuration in every one of those devices that follows me, okay? I have this investment that requires that I maintain it. So if I try to recover from the um, failure of an operating system by attack or through age and extinguishing operations from that, um, I have a challenge trying to recover to that known state for the OS. My data problems also remain unless I'm using some kind of cloud storage mechanism, in which case it gets both easier and harder. It's easier in the sense that the backup could be made for us in the cloud. It's harder in the sense, what if I want to put in a contingency for cloud storage failure? Can I, in fact, have a backup from my cloud service provider that gives me on-site coverage at an adequate level? So, what does that do to office productivity in the small office setting? We've seen interesting stories about how bad it is in big organizations with professional IT staff when something goes sideways. Not throwing any stones, but my own organization has experienced that in recent years. We had a, a didn't we have a situation of 18 months ago where we had a touch on every computer in the whole organization? If I'm not mistaken, I think we did. When you have to touch every system in the organization, the costs get high quickly. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm misremembering. At the enterprise level, you have a whole bunch of backup options that let you do more things more completely, more timely, uh, more accurately. You have things like database shadowing, electronic vaulting. You have remote journaling capabilities. All of that to protect your data. Your configuration is usually managed in a very large organization with a standardized deployment model where you don't store or allow storage of data on local devices. You only use them as platforms, and you put all the data in your data storage architecture, SAN, NAS, cloud, whatever you're using, and then you protect that. And then when an individual operating system becomes compromised, you recover to baseline and move forward from there. It simplifies the problem, but only because you can throw tons of resources at it. And that doesn't work as well in the SOHO small business environment. Okay, computer. There we go. So let's add some new words to your lexicon if you've never used these before. A new backup is when you create a file that had never previously existed and you back it up. Sometimes we do a new, notice the air quotes, a new backup on everything on a computer for the first time when we're backing it up. or when we become convinced that our backup architecture needs a new backup. An incremental backup is a periodic process that you would put in place that senses new files that, have that are new um, since the last time we ran backup and adds those files to your backup stream. So we call it new or incremental backups, right? Duplication of only the files that have been modified since the previous incremental backup as opposed to a differential backup, which picks up everything since the last full backup. You see the difference? Incremental backups are the backups of new files or changed files since the last incremental backup. Differential backups are everything that's changed or is new since the last full backup. Full backups are done usually on a periodic basis. Now, if you're really paranoid, in certain settings, as I have been when I was doing this for production, we did a full backup every day. In a slack period, we'd look at our, our usage statistics, we'd find the, the slackest period we had, uh, which was usually 2, 3 a.m. Eastern time, the way our corporation was structured, and we would do a full backup of everything every night to a new set, a set of new media, verified media, right? And then we would immediately take that full backup and recover it to a new computer, a completely duplicate 
completely fail-safe, redundant computer system with all the capabilities of the production system. We would do a full backup and we do a full re restore to the backup, the fail-safe system. And then we would run an extensive comparison process between the two to make sure they were in the same exact state. That's paranoia right there, that's it. That's the ultimate in backup, two completely redundant systems, one backed up to the other. Then we would take the media that we had used for that full restore that was now validated and send it off site. Okay, now we're talking an optimum strategy here. We do a full backup, we do a full restore, we test the validity of the full restore, and then we send that media out to be stored in an off-site location. From the moment the backup here finished, we start doing minute-by-minute minute incrementals. If a file changes, we write it to backup media. Periodically, we move to new media. As the media is released, we, we get it ready, we stage it. The next night, we send all the incrementals from that day to the off-site storage location. We don't apply them to the shadow system, to the fail-safe system, because it's a snapshot system. We don't, didn't need to apply those. Okay, so incremental, everything that's changed since the last incremental. Full, everything that's, uh, I'm sorry, uh, differential, everything that's changed since the last full. Full backup, we back up everything, and then to the degree possible, we test, test, test. Now, so here's a, a diagram that might help us understand a little bit of what I'm talking about. If we're trying to back up data and we want to do it in near real time, we're going to use one of these incremental strategies. If we're trying to back up applications closer to real time, we might use an incremental application state backup. If we're dealing with operating systems, we're probably only going to deal with them at a differential level. And we might only do that weekly because to be truthful, in most settings, operating system change rates are low. At least historically they're low. In modern times, with the amount of uh, updates we get, that might be daily. I don't know. So maybe my chart needs to change a smidgen. How are you going to achieve a good backup strategy? How are you going to build one? More importantly then, once you've built it, how are you going to test it? So there are solutions that are in the marketplace that people, as individuals, as organizations like small businesses or as enterprises can use. And I wouldn't presume to give you a full briefing on what enterprise backup strategies could be like with modern tools. They involve elaborate cloud strategies that are fail safe by on-site backups. But in reality, we're talking about built-in tools, um, freeware tools, and consumer grade tools. Enterprise grade tools are on the next slide. So what we're talking about here is that there are features of every operating system built in from the manufacturer today that have some backup capabilities that are possible to you as a consumer of that device if you're using them. Right? They aren't automatic. So let's take Windows as an example. So the Windows desktop computer or one of the Surface variants that's like a desktop that's portable has the built-in capability to back itself up locally and or to attached storage and or to cloud devices that you can define as a, as a function of the operating system. I'm a little old school. I like the Windows 7 version better. So I like Windows 7 backup and restore better than the one built into Windows 10. But so that's what I use. But it's there. It doesn't cost me anything. It's a function and feature of the operating system. All you have to do is remember to turn it on. Configure it properly, and then make sure it stays running properly. Oh, wait, have you tested it? Do you know if the restore functions built into Windows work? Have you tried? Don't know, asking rhetorical questions. Right. Your Macintosh, if you're using one of those, has a built-in set of features. I think it's called Time Machine, isn't it? I'm not a Mac user, but if you configure the Mac properly, and I think it configures by default. I believe Time Machine runs by default in Macs. Um, you're ha you have a known good state for every major change you've made in your Mac over time. And so if you have the media where your Time Machine has been written to, notice the if at the front of that sentence, you can recover it back to any known state. 
What if your hard drive failed? And that was where you stored your recovery information. Well, guess what? You won't be recovering that Macintosh. So how are you going to back up your backups? I mean, how will you get to a known good state if the hardware fails that you're reliant on to get to your known good state? So just because you have a warm, fuzzy feeling because your manufacturer has a pretty aggressive product that does pretty good backups pretty much automatically, it doesn't mean you're out of the backup woods yet. Because until you have actually operationalized recovery and tested it, you are not certain that it's going to work. No, it might work for most people most of the time. But it's not going to work for you every time, which is what the, the criteria needs to be here. Windows servers have a little higher standard of performance. And they usually come with a little better product mix to do that. If you're running a Windows server as a personal device, right? Uh, spend some time looking into how you want to do your backup and recovery operations with it. LAMP servers, which run Linux, you know, Apache, some kind of database product, some kind of PHP or web engine, something that's servicing a, a, a client or community for web services, will need to have its own backup strategy operationalized as well. Now, most of the LAMP platform tools that you might acquire either free or to purchase, are going to have a suite of tools built in to do backups. But the functionality of backup and recovery that you get is dependent on you configuring them properly. They do not come out of the box working the way you may want them to, if they're working at all. My experience is a lot of times these backup and recovery features are not implemented by default. They're relying on the skill the knowledge, the understanding of the operator, the owner, the system admin, to configure the backup properly. And equally important, if not more so, to test the recovery capability of that backup strategy. And if you're not testing the backup, uh, I'm sorry, the restore capability of the backup strategy, it's not really a backup strategy, it's mostly a wish. Right? So you set up your backup, you start taking backups, you think backups are running, you see indicators of backup completion. Right now, you're very hopeful that you have a backup strategy. But you don't know that you do. You won't know that you have a backup strategy that can work until you've done a restore and it restored. Right. So put testing even up just as high as planning and operationalizing as a backup strategy. Some of us rely on freeware for our backup and say, oh, that's, that's great. I'll use. Dropbox, and I'll get the free account on Dropbox, or I'll even pay a little fee and get some Dropbox space, and I will set up uh, and just only use Dropbox to save all my files. Does that make you 100% safe? No, a couple of reasons. One, my own personal experience, Dropbox sometimes corrupts files. I have had files that the state has dropped out of usability on Dropbox. I probably caused it. I did it, but it still happened. I can't blame Dropbox. So if you're not backing up your Dropbox, you're probably not going to get close to a high state of readiness for failure. On top of which, if you're using Dropbox as your production storage and you get a ransomware attack and it corrupts the Dropbox, it makes it really hard to recover from. Yeah, it's true you can go back to prior versions for some period of time in Dropbox, but maybe not as far as you need to go, or maybe it won't have the version you want, so you're not off the hook. Just because you're using a cloud provider doesn't mean you don't need a backup strategy. And it certainly doesn't mean you don't need a tested backup strategy. Some of us will actually spend some money, and with Carbonite it can be some serious money, to buy a commercial grade approach for backup and recovery from a corporation that purports to do that in the cloud. And that's what Carbonite purports to do. It has competitors. I don't mean this as an endorsement. It's just I have familiarity with it. There's products like Mosey. I'm sure there's others out there, dozens of them probably. Um, the idea here is that you're outsourcing the backup and recovery to this provider, but it doesn't get you off the obligation of having to test it to make sure that you can recover from it. If you have such a service like Mosey or Carbonite, have you in fact done a full system recovery from it? If you haven't, how do you know it will work? If you have, was it successful to get you back to your known good state? 
Those are just some to-dos to think about. Now, if you're not an individual using Carbonite and you're a corporation or an enterprise doing large-scale backup of data and you haven't centralized your data requirements to servers, to file servers, how are you going to recover all those hundreds and dozens of systems that are deployed in the field? You have to have a strategy for that, too. They have to be backed up. Those backups have to be validated. And you have to have a provable, uh, feasible means of doing restoration to a known good state on every single system that's connected to your network. A lot of times, people that, unfortunately, business managers that make decisions about these things don't understand the true cost of allowing distributed data storage like that. They say, I'll oh, just put this stuff on each person's computer. Back it up there, and if it, if it gets deleted, well, we'll recover it. And they don't understand the true cost of having 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 data stores scattered across the physical plant of the corporation, of the enterprise. OK, commercial products. You have some considerations here to be made. So for instance, um, in a commercial environment where you're doing local data center operations, you can have RAID. You can afford to do a RAID solution. You can afford to do on-site backup strategies relying on technologies like NAS or SAN uh, techniques. So you can have two giant attached network devices that are doing storage. One's primary and one's a backup. Okay. Then you could do cool things like I was talking about earlier, where periodically you do a full backup of your st attached storage. And then you go to your backup storage device and do a full recovery to it to validate that it works. And then you leave that available as a hot swap mirror. Now, if you want to get really cool, what you do is you put in redundant systems with RAID where you, you have your primary storage automatically backing things up in RAID while you go so that you're protected from hardware failures. It still doesn't get you off the hook to recover from things like ransomware, though, does it? Because remember, the problem with ransomware attacks is that the actual primary storage channel that you're using becomes corrupted. It becomes encrypted, and you can no longer access it. So it doesn't get you off the hook for being able to back up to a known good state that's isolated from your production state. Because the point of recovery in a ransomware scenario is that the backup environment was isolated from the production site state. So real-time backup is pretty cool. You can do things like database shadowing, electronic vaulting, remote journaling. These are all really cool things. The problem is if you're doing remote journaling and you get encrypted by a ransomware attack, your remote site is now encrypted. So that doesn't get you off the hook for needing a full backup with periodic incrementals or differentials or both stored off-site and offline. So don't ever let the allure of these advanced off-site backup options take you away from the fact that periodic full backups with tested restores and incremental and differential stop gaps along the way are going to get you a solution that gives you assurance of security, assurance of recoverability. A tested recovery plan is your only justifiable position to have as a security professional. The cornerstone of every data protection activity that we engage in is backup, tested, restore, continuously maintain, ready to use. Okay. As a rule of thumb, you should say you need three, at least three routes to full recovery of data. And by three routes, I'm talking about yesterday's full backup and all of the incrementals from today, or two days ago's full backup and two days' worth of incrementals, or three days' worth of full backup and three days' worth of incrementals. So there's three different pathways that you have, preferably stored redundantly. Preferably. Not always possible, but preferably. Guess what? You say, you know what? I've got a full backup. It's in a case. We put this case right here, and the guy with the van came and he got it. And they hauled it back to Iron Mountain, and they stored it away, and it's perfectly preserved. Oh, wait, we need that. And you call them up, and you say, hey, guys, bring me my backups from yesterday. Um, 
well, we've been meaning to call you. That van was in an accident. And uh, it, the van flipped over and landed in the river, and all the tapes in it were wet. Oh, can that happen? Oh, yeah. Has that happened? Oh, yeah. Ask Citibank, who one day had a van pick up a bunch of tapes that were backed up of everything they had, and they shipped it with the shipper, and the shipper lost it. Has, I don't know that it's been found yet. That was like 15 years ago. Okay. Kind of crazy, isn't it? Um, three is a good number. I like three. Three complete paths to victory. Three, time, three ways of knowing that you have a full backup that somewhere you can get to to start from with, three separate, with a, a separate path to full recovery from each of those three starting points. That would be the minimum I would consider to be acceptable for a recovery strategy. A backup strategy, I, I don't think we should call them backup strategies anymore. You should call them recovery strategies because until you've tested them and you know that they work, they aren't really anything more than a wish. So, every backup and restore strategy that you want to rely on must be tested continuously. You, this isn't something that you test and say, oh, it works and I don't have to worry about it again. You need to develop a business practice that you follow religiously that tests your recovery capability as part of your production cycle. If you mount up a backup, you spin the tapes or cartridges or me optical media or whatever it is you're spinning and it finishes and you put it in a bin and you send it off site, you just failed. Because how do you know that that particular media is readable? You don't. I go all the way back to when I was in college working at a data center as a student assistant and we had a little bitty PDP-8 computer and it had about 20 megabytes of storage on hard disk and all it was was a program that ran the RJE site. Just ran the RJE from the UT Austin site back to data, uh, our data center in San Marcos. Little bitty program, little bitty computer, it had a backup and we were told we need to run backup on it every night as part of our procedure. So we had a little run book and we'd flip it open and say, okay, mount the tape, mount the tape, type this in the console, type this in the console. When the, when the red light stops flashing, pull it out, right? Put it in the bin and send it over to archival storage so that it's over there, great. So finally one day the computer crapped out, had to recover from backup, and so we got the backup tape sent over and tried to read it and it was blank. Blank tape. Thought, no problem, we got one from the night before. Brought it over, it's blank too. We had like 30 days worth, because it wasn't that big of a tape, it was a little bitty thing. 30 blank tapes were in storage. Apparently, two or three, four, six months before, a field service engineer had come out and replaced the heads on that thing, and he used a magnetized screwdriver. And the head had been magnetized, which meant that the read-write head of the tape drive was no longer writing. We had no clue, we didn't know. So field service engineer has to now get us the base operating system for that computer. We had to reprogram it completely so it would work as an RJE site. So it took what should have been a five or 10 minute operation once the tape was on site, turned it into a three or four day outage. And that's not at all unusual or atypical. So if your backup strategy is not tested continuously comprehensively and completely, and if it doesn't allow you multiple redundant pathways to recover, it's not really a recovery strategy. It's like a recovery wish or a recovery hope, right? So those are the requirements that we have in place to make any backup and recovery approach something that you could rely on in an enterprise or even in a small business or even at your house for your personal data. Okay, so in conclusion, whether you're talking about your Quicken checkbook uh, that you use, or you're talking about um, the corporate transaction processing system that you're responsible for, it really doesn't matter if you don't have the ability to recover it, as I've outlined before. Remember that backup is the final line of defense in all scenarios. All of them rely on backup and ability to restore to a known good state 
as the bottom line for recovery. The scary part is that in today's world, if you do not have uh, the ability to recover to a known state, you may have lost everything if that attack is one of a certain class like ransomware or not pet you, which isn't even ransomware. It's more of an assassinware product. It's designed to remove your data from the system and make you think it's been encrypted. In fact, it was only designed to destroy your data. How do you recover from Petya, not Petya, or WannaCry, or any of the other ransomware variants if you don't have the ability to recover your production state to a known good state? The fact is, you don't. Remember, keep calm and rely on your trusted restore plan. Are there any questions? Anybody? No? Oh. It's all patently obvious, right? These are just truths I'm stating. There's really no argument to be had about this because at the end of the analysis, if you don't have a backup that you can restore to a known good state, you don't really have anything. 